The earliest history of Babylon is little known. Among the many cities flourishing in southern Iraq, the town first appears in texts in the 3rd millennium BC. Until the last century of the 3rd millennium, few references existed to Babylon. However, offerings made to the temple of Enlil in Nippur during this period, when Babylon was part of an empire ruled by Ur, suggest a city already of some size and wealth. From relative obscurity in the middle of the 18th century BC, Babylon emerged as the political center of southern Mesopotamia. It held this position almost continuously for the next 1,400 years. Near Baghdad, around 85 kilometers south of the Euphrates, is the site of Babylon. The area is located north of the great alluvial plain of southern Iraq, a landscape of silts deposited by the Tigris and Euphrates into a vast rift created by tectonic movement as the Arabian plate slips beneath the neighboring Eurasian plate. In addition to defining modern-day Iraq's northern and eastern boundaries, the Taurus and Zagros mountain ranges were created by the same collision. As a result, Mesopotamia encompasses several environmental zones, but Babylon itself is found in the flat alluvial plain in southern Iraq. In addition to containing one of the world's earliest cities, the table is subject to several significant environmental constraints that have shaped human settlements since long before the foundation of Babylon. Rain-fed agriculture is beyond the reach of this area due to its high temperatures. Despite the little precipitation this part of Iraq receives, it is uneven and unreliable. The bulk of a season's rain can fall in a single downpour, damaging crops as severe droughts, for human habitation is dependent on the two great rivers, and the permanent settlement requires irrigation. Upon establishment, however, on the levees of canals, such a system could benefit from the rich alluvial soils and support highly productive agriculture. In explaining the region's early urbanization and accompanying economic development, many contend that the region's ability to produce large agricultural surpluses played a significant role, though in what way is hotly contested. Herodotus was undoubtedly impressed. As a grain-bearing country, Assyria, meaning Mesopotamia, is the richest globally. He writes in his description of the 5th century BC, figs, grapes, olives, or other fruit trees are not grown there, but the grain fields tend to produce crops 200-fold and 300-fold in exceptional years. At least three inches wide are the wheat and barley blades. Millet and sesame grow to an astonishing size, as I know. But those who have not visited Babylon have refused to believe even what I have already described as its fertility. Sesame oil is the only oil they use, and date palms, most of which bear fruit, provide them with food, wine, and honey. It was necessary to constantly maintain the infrastructure that facilitated such abundance, including the irrigation system and the parallel drainage system, since water can also bring salt to the surface through capillary action making the land too saline for agriculture. Water control was an essential source of power and conflict during the ancient world, just as it is today, as Iraq and its upstream neighbors, Turkey and Syria, struggle with competing water demands. Although labor organization requirements resulting from this need may not have been the primary driving force behind the earliest urbanization during the fourth millennium BC, where canal systems were relatively modest. By the middle of the third millennium BC, a large amount of labor was required to maintain significant canal systems. This very flat area is also subject to natural or artificial changes in river courses. Similarly, massive engineering projects to change water courses figure prominently in ancient Greek stories about Babylon, where water course changes are an essential military strategy. The majority of our knowledge about Babylon has come from excavations conducted by the Deutsch Orient Gesellschaft between 1899 and 1917. It has been challenging to explore Babylon's early history due to the high water table. Excavations concentrated on the later phases of occupation, mainly Nebuchadnezzar II's 604-562 BC reconstruction 
of the city center in the 6th century BC. Several older monuments, including the famous Code of Hammurabi, were actually found in the Iranian city of Susa. These treasures were looted from Babylon and carried there in antiquity by the Elamite king Shutruk Nahunte, circa 1185-1155 BC, in the 12th century BC. Moreover, the cult statues of Marduk, the city's chief god, and his consort, Zarpanitu, were among the booty from the same invasion. His name was derived from an illustrious predecessor who at the end of the 12th century BC recovered Babylon's honor and prosperity when he recovered the statues. Ancient Babylonia. As Mesopotamia developed into a polity of more considerable powers during the third millennium BC, there were no longer city-states, but larger states, even empires. During the later centuries of the third millennium, archeologists have been unable to determine the exact location of Akkad, a city in southern Iraq, whose precise location has not yet been determined, Ur. And finally, the rival powers of Isin and Lhasa ruled multiple towns in the south. It is believed that the rise of Babylon to a position of central political importance dates back to Hammurabi's reign, 1790 to 1752 BC, the most famous king of an Amorite dynasty based on their likely tribal origins, who ruled from the early 19th century BC. Following a period of territorial competition in which the cities of Isin and Lhasa had dominated, Babylon gained the upper hand, first as the leader of a coalition, then as the sole ruler. By the end of Hammurabi's reign in the mid-18th century BC, Babylon had established hegemony over southern Iraq and a significant area to the north. The urban literate Mesopotamian world had been around for over a millennium by this time, as had the civic institutions. Hammurabi's modern title of lawgiver which he has been given since then, does not quite do him justice. Instead, his political and military successes make him the most crucial figure. The conquest of Lhasa allowed him to claim the title of King of Sumer and Akkad, i.e. southern Iraq as well, which was followed by the conquest of Mari to the north and eventually of Ashur and Nineveh. As Hammurabi established Babylon's superiority among the cities of southern Iraq, it was successfully defended. Although the so-called Sealand dynasty challenged it heavily in the south. The first dynasty of Babylon, rulers since the early 19th century BC, retained power and part of Hammurabi's territory until 1595 BC. As another and even more enduring legacy, Babylon remained the principal political center of southern Mesopotamia which, from this point forward, we can call Babylonia. Until the time of Seleucus I Nicator and the founding of Seleucia on the Tigris near the end of the 4th century BC, Babylon's rise to power as a powerful city has been the subject of legend, which is entirely appropriate. The Code of Hammurabi, popularly known as the world's first Code of Laws, is one of the most important and iconic objects in the Mesopotamian collection of the Musée du Louvre, if the laws are still the first cuneiform texts, studied by students of Assyriology, the study of ancient Mesopotamian languages and literature, there are older lists of laws that exist, but the number of laws and their presentation in such a striking public format gives the Code of Hammurabi a unique significance. Kassite Babylon Hammurabi's successors saw their fortunes wane over time until eventually the gradual weakening of Babylonian power allowed the Anatolian Hittite Empire to launch a brief but highly successful military raid on Mesopotamia and even Babylon itself, 1595 BC. After this incursion, the old Babylonian period ended and a more fragmented era began, which, at least from a Babylonian perspective, was dominated by a dynasty of Kassite kings at the end of the 18th century BC, the Kassites first appear in Mesopotamian texts. Nevertheless, they are only visible in Babylon's story by the 16th century. 
The people from the Zagros Mountains in Iran speak a non-Semitic language, unrelated to Babylonian. Kassite families are thought to have settled in Mesopotamia in increasing numbers during the 17th century BC. While a Kassite kingdom bordering Babylon may have posed a military threat. However, the Hittites, under Mershali I, circa 1620 to 1595 BC, ended the first dynasty of Babylon. If not for the court intrigue in the Hittite capital of Hattusha and the assassination of Mershali shortly after the raid, the Hittite presence might have lasted a lot longer. As a result, the other neighbors battled over a desperately weakened Babylon. The Saarland kings of the south are thought to have held Babylon briefly in the 16th century BC, before the Kassites took control of the city and northern Mesopotamian plains. However, the evidence for the 16th century BC is highly sparse. It is also not clear at what point Kassite control was established, based on a later document, indicates that during the reign of Kassite king Argum II, the statues of Marduk and the consort Zarpanitu were recovered from the Hittite capital, Hattusha, where they had been taken even before Moshili I's invasion, and returned to the great temple Esagila in Babylon circa 1570 BC. This act marked the beginning, if not the legitimation, of four centuries of Kassite rule. By the mid-15th century, the Kassites also controlled the southern region of Babylonia, previously held by the sea lands. Kassite settlements returned to a more rural pattern during the period. Archaeological survey data suggest that smaller payments became more common overall in southern Mesopotamia, while numbers of larger settlements declined. Kurigalzu I, circa 1375 BC, carried monumental building projects in Babylon and other cities. Kassites was a large and prosperous state, but they never achieved international political or military dominance. During the latter half of the second millennium BC, other significant powers included the Hittite Empire in Turkey and Mitanni, a kingdom composed of small Hurrian states unified at around 1500 BC and covering much of Syria and northern Iraq at its height. Because of the incredible archive known as the Amarna Letters, the period has been described as an international age. Documents discovered in Akhetatan, the capital of Amarna, reveal the correspondence between Amenophis III and Akhenaten and Kassite kings at Babylon, written in Babylonian cuneiform. The kings of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East engaged in similar posts, along with gift exchange and intermarriage, in the 14th to 15th centuries BC, according to tablets from Iraq, Syria, the Levant, and Anatolia. Kuduras are large stone land grants inscribed with texts, religious motifs, and sometimes human figures, distinctively Kassite Babylonian artifacts. However, the iconography of these monuments is clearly Babylonian, and the inscriptions are written in Babylonian cuneiform. Kassite material and visual culture differ from the preceding Old Babylonian period, yet exhibit continuity with the earlier Mesopotamian world. Assimilation was a typical pattern in Babylon's history, where conquerors emulated or adapted Babylonian cultural forms rather than trying to impose their own. Even if the reasons for this trend have varied over time, the trend certainly indicates the significance that Babylon held in terms of culture, religion, and politics. The Elamite community and others. Assyrian king, Tukulti Ninurta I, 1243 to 1207 BC, sacked Babylon during the reign of Kassite king Kashtiliashu IV, 1232 to 1225 BC. A substantial amount of destruction took place, at least according to Assyrian texts. It is said that Tukulti Ninurta I returned to Babylon, put to the sword. The Babylonians after one destroyed the wall of Babylon. Within the booty, Esagil and Babylon's properties were taken. Upon removing Marduk from his throne, he sent him to Assyria 
putting his governors in Karduniash, Babylon, was his decision. Karduniash was ruled by Tukulti Ninurta I for seven years. Assyria ruled Babylon for the first time. Sargon and Naram Sin, the first empire builders in ancient Mesopotamia, held titles such as King of Sumer and Akkad and King of the Upper and Lower Seas, i.e. from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf. When Tukulti Ninurta described this event in his royal inscriptions, he might have been echoing the language of Akkadian kings. Amid the battle, King Katiliau declares, I captured Katiliau, king of the Kassites, just like a footstool. I took him captive and brought him to my lord. Since the lower sea borders my land on the east, I became lord over Sumer and Akkad. The Mediterranean and Middle Eastern worlds experienced instability and upheaval during Tukulti Ninurta's reign, and Babylonian power was weakened. Assyrian control was cut in Babylon due to Elamite interference, although Adad Shuma Usur, 1216 to 1187 BC, Meli Shipak, 1186 to 1172 BC, and Marduk Apla Edina the first. 1171 to 1159 BC. Then, military pressure from Assyria and Elam ended the Kassite state, though. The Elamite king, Shutruk Nahunte, attacked the city in 1159 BC. His son was installed as king of Babylon during this time, and several Babylonian monuments were taken to the Elamite capital at Susa. Today, Hammurabi's code is the most famous of these but much more deeply felt at the time was the loss of Marduk's statue. It was an ancient tradition in Mesopotamia to take a city's god, and the act had various meanings. Cult statues were naturally valuable objects, but that was just the beginning. Statues in ancient Iraq were much more than images. In a sense, they are still unclear today. It was as if they were gods themselves. The fact that a foreign army could kill the gods' statues in a city suggested that the city had been abandoned by the gods. Thus, the loss of cult statues was a humiliating and traumatic experience, and their recovery was a crucial civic honor, even centuries later. Babylon was ruled for several centuries by the descendants of more or less local dynasties. Although the dynasty never returned to power during the brief Elamite rule, the dynasty faced violent Kassite resistance. Under Nebuchadnezzar I, 1125 to 1104 BC, the second dynasty of Isin recovered the statue of Marduk from Susa after a successful military campaign, an event that had significant ramifications for Babylonian cultural identity. During the third millennium BC, Nebuchadnezzar's reinstallation of Marduk in Babylon represents the culmination of his rise from obscure origins to prominence. During this time, Enuma Elish first appeared in the Babylonian epic of creation, which justified Marduk's, and thus Babylon's, preeminence by his heroic role in the conquest of chaos at the beginning of time. The Assyrian Empire Although Nebuchadnezzar I achieved incredibly Babylonia did not gain long-term independence. The reign of Nebuchadnezzar was the most successful of the second dynasty of the Isin kings, and raids by Aramean tribal groups throughout his successors revealed the limits of Babylonian state power. Tiglath Pileser I, 1114-1076 BC, revived Assyrian fortunes, and by the first millennium BC, Babylon was once again weak politically and militarily. Assyria prospered under successive kings who developed their small state in northern Iraq into one of the most powerful military powers in the region, with an empire covering much of the Middle East. Until the 8th century BC, Babylon remained independent. tiglath pileser III increasingly campaigned in the south following his accession in 745 BC initially against Chaldean and Aramean tribal enemies. Upon the end of his rule in 727 BC, 
Babylonia was under the direct control of the Assyrians. Shalmaneser V's brief reign, 726 to 722 BC, and the rise to power of the usurper Sargon II, 721 to 705 BC, allowed Babylonia to assert its independence under Marduk Apla Edina II, the biblical Merodach Baladan, the ruler of the Chaldean Bit Yakin tribe, who installed himself as king of Babylon in 721 BC maintaining Babylonia's independence until completely overthrown by Sargon in 710 BC. Babylonian rebels regularly faced Assyrian rule in the 8th and 7th centuries BC. Bit Takuri, Bit Amukani, and Bit Yakin were powerful Chaldean tribes whose territory spanned from Borsippa near Babylon, south along the Euphrates to the Persian Gulf, Assyrian armies found the tribes to be quite mobile, possibly because they made the most of the landscape and environment than their more powerful opponents. Compared to their neighbours in the cities of northern Babylonia, they were less at risk from Assyrian campaigns. The Assyrian control over Babylonia was constantly threatened, especially by Sennacherib. Martuk Apla Edina briefly took control of Babylon following a revolt in 703 BC after defeating the rebellion, Sennacherib installed Bel Ibni as Babylon's king, a Babylonian raised in the Assyrian court. Sennacherib was forced to fight a new campaign against Marduk Apla Edina due to the resistance, resulting in the removal of Bel Ibni from the throne and the installation of his son as king of Babylon, Ashur Nadin Shumi. Babylonia again rebelled against Assyria in 694 BC, triggered by an Elamite invasion of Babylonia itself. Nergal Ushezib took over Ashur Nadin Shumi's kingship after he was captured, apparently by Babylonian conspirators. Nergal Ushezib ruled for a short time. He was captured by the Assyrians in 693 BC and killed. Although Babylon was well defended, it had to endure a protracted siege. Mushebid Marduk continued the rebellion, but Assyria was militarily superior to Babylonia. Here is an example from a contemporary legal source. During Mushezib Marduk's reign, Babylonia was ravaged by siege, famine, hunger, want, and hard times. Everything had been destroyed. One shekel of silver was worth two kwa of barley. There was no way out of the city, as all four gates were barred. In Babylon, the squares were filled with dead men without anyone to bury them. It remains unclear whether Babylon was taken by force or forced to surrender due to starvation in 689 BC. In the aftermath of Sennacherib's actions and the abolition of Babylon's independent kingship, it could be argued that Sennacherib's actions were measures of last resort essential to the ending of a five-year war. Babylon held a special place in Mesopotamian culture, so attacks against the city were not taken casually. Despite this, Sennacherib's own texts emphasize the extent of the destruction. On cliff faces near the mouth of Sennacherib's irrigation canal for his capital at Nineveh, the Bavarian inscription is explicit. The city and its houses were all destroyed from foundation to parapet, they were devastated, burned. The outer and inner walls of the town, the temples and the ziggurat were razed, and their bricks and earthwork were discarded into the Aratu Canal. To prevent future generations from recognizing the site of the city's temples, I dissolved the area with water and made it look inundated land. My canals sliced through the center of the town. I filled it with water, eroded its foundations, and destroyed it more comprehensively than a devastating flood. Babylon's cultural and religious importance made its destruction all the more shocking, and both Babylonian and Assyrian historical texts later avoided the topic, at times attributing it to a flood brought on by the wrath of Marduk. Having failed to install a loyal vassal as king of Babylon, Sennacherib now ruled directly over the kingdom. This is the second time Marduk's statue has been moved, probably to Ashur. 
The Akitu Chronicle records that the New Year festival did not occur during the 20-year absence of the figure from Babylon. During the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC, Babylonia was depopulated in a broader sense. As a result of the deportations into the Assyrian heartland, there was less danger of dissent and rebellion and provisions for ambitious building programs at Nineveh and agricultural work elsewhere in the empire. Esarhaddon, the son and successor of Sennacherib, 681 to 669 BC, faced further rebellions, but also rebuilt Babylon after it had seemingly been abandoned for 11 years following Sennacherib's destruction. According to his inscriptions, the rebuilding of Babylon was accompanied by a resurgence of the piety and reverence for Babylon, traditionally expressed by Assyrian kings, and was only temporarily interrupted during Sennacherib's reign. According to various versions, the Assyrians assembled a massive group of workers drawn from Babylonia, Assyria, and or conquered lands, and Esarhaddon claimed to have personally participated in the project. The following is how Brinkman summarizes their content. In Esarhaddon's Babylon inscriptions, the focus is given to the divine framework within which Babylon became extinct and was resurrected. Malportant omina, the iniquitous conduct of the Babylonians, including misappropriation of temple funds, the destruction of the city by a severe flood, Marduk's decision to shorten the years of desolation from 70 to 11, auspicious omina, and restoration. The king of Babylon, however, was not installed by Caesar Haddon. Assyria and Babylonia were inherited by two of his sons, Ashurbanipal and Shamash Shuma Ukin. Ashurbanipal was to hold authority over both kingdoms, though this arrangement that did not separate the empire but sought to place the two brothers in a close but unequal relationship 